Hi, welcome to the second session of the Northwestern Business Reviews video series. My name is Jackson Siegel. And my name is Sophia Su. In today's video, we will be interviewing Professor Dale Mortensen, the winner of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Economics. I hope you enjoy. <laughs> well, I've uh, spent a lot of time working on the way labor markets operate, uh, actually probably for 40 years I've been working on that issue, and particularly how to integrate a track, what we call a tractable model, one that you can deal with, into uh, a macroeconomic framework so that one can study the uh, un and understand how labor markets respond to uh, fluctuations in business activity. Well, the, uh, the labor market has some particular, uh, not unique to the labor market, but there's a certain set of markets that have uh, particular properties that are not well uh, captured by, shall we say, the sort of standard demand and supply story that all of you learn in the you know, first course you take. That story is very insightful because it focuses on the two sides of the market and how the two sides of the market interact, but it abstracts from a number of uh, complications. Uh, an important one is uh, where does exchange take place in the hypothetical supply and demand model? You have to sort of think about it as an auctioneer, so it's a centralized market. It's sort of like a market for assets uh, like or commodities like the commodity exchange downtown. Uh, all, the, all the buyers and sellers are represented by agents on the floor at the time or on the computer, one or two, um, no issue. That's not the way the labor market operates, all right? The transactions take place in a very decentralized way. Now, because there's not a centralization, it's uh, expensive to find out for a worker where the best opportunity is for employment and conversely employer where the best worker is. Uh, so that's where the search friction comes in. The time and money it takes to match workers and employers in that decentralized market is uh, what we're talking about. We're talking about search friction in the labor market. But there are other markets like that, for the, for example, the housing market. It's even been applied to the mating of um, insects, right? <laughs> but it's particularly important for understanding how the labor market re reacts particularly to business cycle activity. More recently, say 10 years or so, I've been quite interested in the implications of firm heterogeneity. Um, the uh, the uh, sort of big issue there is the fact that once we had data on individual firms, we quickly realized that the proposition uh, that aggregate output is maximized doesn't hold. That it, proposition requires that marginal products of input factors like labor, marginal products of labor, are the same across all firms. They're simply not. All right. So that dispersion in marginal productivity suggests, on the face of it, there's misallocation of resources. You can increase total output by taking workers from low productivity firms and putting them in high productivity firms. Uh, that's in fact a big feature, of course, in development. That's part of the development process. That development is, is, is uh, making better use of existing uh, factors. And uh, even at the firm level, there are large differences uh, that exist in developing econ economies like uh, China and, uh, and uh, India. In fact, the dispersion across firms and productivity in those two uh, countries is about twice to three times more uh, dispersed. So the wonder of the issues we've been looking at recently is, uh, are those differences real or are they reflecting some dynamics of, of, of firm development? Um, uh, well, one of the hypotheses is, at least in developing countries, that these differences are due to various kinds of, of, uh, of uh, frictions, including um, uh, things like uh, favoritism, uh, uh, bribes, so not a level playing field, all right, the lack of um, sort of perfect competition. Uh, I've been 
uh, and some of my colleagues have been looking at data for highly developed countries, namely Denmark, where, where we have detailed information, and we can use that information. And we're also pretty sure that those kinds of factors are not important. All right. It's still true that there is there are differences in firm productivity, just as not as large. Uh, then the question is whether those differences in productivity are due to differences, for example, in the quality of the workers across firms. That's something we can check with, with, with the kind of data we have for developed countries in Europe that we can't do for developing countries. It's a, 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 at least a, a good place to test some of the alternative theories about what's going on with these differences. The other possible source of differences are firm entry and exit, uh, technology, dispersion takes time, all these sorts of things. And we too can check on some of those with this, these kinds of data that we couldn't do with developing countries. Let's start with the volatility issue. And uh, there, of course, the, 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 the issue is why did the U.S. labor market, and to some extent European mar labor markets, um, uh, why were they so uh, badly or heavily impacted by the financial crisis? Uh, there are supposed to be mechanisms that buffer that, like changes in wages and interest rates, which simply you know, didn't do. So that's, that's one of the issues in the global world. Um, shocks one place uh, uh, impact other countries, and uh, that was particularly true of the, our, uh, you know, um, the, verbal, the, the real estate right. market bursting, and then the following banking crisis had big impacts on Europe and on developing countries. I mean, China had a significant, uh, but short, but significant recession as well. Uh, so the, what the globalization means is that now movements uh, with business cycle activity are much more global than they were. They're, from the total future, U.S. position, I mean, this, that's a huge question, we have position the global economy. Uh, yeah, that, that one's just really hard to say. What we do know is that we have to, uh, 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 to stay competitive. Well, let, let me put it this way. The current Chinese growth rate is temporary. There's just no way it can be maintained. Uh, just to give an analogy, uh, there was a similar uh, growth spurt in Japan after World War II. Mm -hmm. That high growth rate comes from, you know, in, it's in the developing stage, and it comes from converting, all right, uh, the work that people do from less productive to highly more productive. It's precisely this, this, this reallocation process. And there's a limit to that. I mean, there's only so many people in China, no matter how many billion that do live there, all right? Uh, so uh, that uh, source of growth is, 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 uh, is limited. Uh, I mean, we're all better off with China and India developing, all right, and that's in the process of happening, and we'll hope it continues. But at some stage, they're going to become developed. So they're going, their growth rate is going to slow down to the rate at which can be sustained by uh, new uh, products, new technology development, new knowledge, just like everybody else in the developed world, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so uh, if you're really looking to the long run, it's uh, uh, in your interest in a particular country, although I'm a citizen of the world, I don't know whether uh, I should be preferring one country to another as a citizen of the world, but if you have that point of view, then the uh, then the uh, advice is uh, uh, invest in education and research. We have a lot to, to absorb yet in terms of the information revolution. Uh, that's one of the factors. I mean, you know, forecasting what the next big um, development is, is really impossible. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of talk, I mean, and you can make mistakes in the, the When I was your age, there was a, 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 a big contention. Well, what are we going to do when energy becomes, you know, 
essentially uh, costless. Right? Because this was the view, right? That one could harness nuclear power and uh, even uh, 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 fusion as well, you know, uh -huh. fusion. Uh, and uh, energy would be essentially costless. Well, that was, you know, obviously wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that revolution never happened. I mean, of course, we developed nuclear energy, but it, it wasn't, uh, didn't provide the benefits that, uh, that, that people thought. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it's very, you can make big mistakes in making the prognosis, but a lot of people now are talking, of course, about medical technology, nanotechnology mm -hmm. as uh, possible. Well, you'll see is that uh, the, those that are growing fastest now, which are some of the developing countries, will slow. Mm -hmm. All right. um, the uh, I mean, there are other areas for development. The major one being, you know, most of sub-equatorial Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, the other one being the Middle East. I mean, that, from an economic point of view, the Middle East is, is very backward. Uh, so. Uh, talking about convergence, that's where there is room for convergence, right? Those two places. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sure. It's been a pleasure. So, in conclusion of this video, we hope you've learned a lot about labor economics and Professor Mortensen's work. For more information, please go to our website at www.northwesternbusinessreview.org or visit our Facebook page or, or follow us on Twitter. And we'll see you next time.